This is episode 8 of Discovering Classical Music, Beethoven's Symphony No. 6, The Pastoral. And thank you to Shannon for the suggestion. If any of you have suggestions or ideas, you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash inside the score. As always, we'll start with some historical background and then we'll look deeper at the music and end with some recommended recordings. So imagine this scenario. It's December 22nd, 1808. You're in Vienna, Austria, and it's cold. You go to a concert where the program is pure Beethoven. In fact, the 38-year-old composer is there himself, and he's going to perform several of his works. Moreover, we're going to hear a bunch of public premieres. There are new works of Beethoven that have never been heard in public before. The concert hall is freezing. And the program? Well, the first half starts with... Beethoven's Symphony No. 6, The Pastoral, the new piece lasting about 40 minutes for orchestra. Then after that, there'll be A Perfido, a concert aria for soprano soloist and orchestra lasting about 13 minutes. This was not a premiere. Then they'll perform The Gloria from his Mass in C Major, which is for solo singers, chorus and orchestra, and that lasts about 10 minutes. Again, not a premiere. Then finally, they're going to perform his Piano Concerto No. 4, which lasts around 35 minutes for piano and orchestra, and this will be played on piano by Beethoven himself. It's another public premiere. But wait, that's just the first half. The second half of the concert starts with a premiere of Beethoven's mighty Fifth Symphony, followed by the Sanctus from his Mass in C major, and then followed by Beethoven playing a Fantasia for solo piano. The concert ended with the premiere of his choral fantasy, which brought together piano solo, vocal soloists, chorus, and orchestra. This piece is about 20 minutes long, and Beethoven only just finished it in time for the concert, meaning that it was deeply under-rehearsed. Imagine all those premieres in one concert, his fifth symphony, his sixth symphony, his piano concerto number four, and his choral fantasy. In total, this historic concert lasted about four hours, four hours of sheer under-rehearsed Beethoven in the freezing cold. One comment from Prince von Lobkowitz reads, There we sat in the most bitter cold from half past six until half past ten, and confirmed for ourselves the maxim that one may easily have too much of a good thing. But looking back on that, we can see what a historical event this was. Beethoven's fifth, his sixth, and then his fourth piano concerto, and his choral fantasy, all premiering in the same concert. The sheer historical weight and influence that those works carry is staggering. What's also noteworthy is the contrast between Beethoven's Fifth and Sixth Symphonies. Most people are familiar with the Fifth, which is deservedly one of the most popular symphonies of all time. I've done a podcast on that symphony before. It's intense, it's powerful, and over the course of the musical journey, its terror and stormy rage turns to jubilations and triumph. The Sixth Symphony is nothing like that, at all. I mean, talk about a contrast between two consecutive symphonies. The musical landscape is mostly one of utter calm and serenity, apart from the storm in the fourth movement. We tend to think of Beethoven's fifth as an expression of deep personal struggle. That's one of the aspects that makes it such a landmark work. But Beethoven's sixth has no personal struggle. It is rather a timeless, artistically ingenious portrayal of the countryside and country life, and the feelings that arise from the countryside. Breaking with symphonic convention, Beethoven's sixth has five movements instead of the usual four. The last three movements are all connected together in a kind of narrative. Moreover, breaking even more with convention and making this symphony unique in Beethoven's output, he provides programmatic titles for each movement. So the first movement is called Awakening of Happy Feelings Upon Arrival at the Countryside. The second movement is titled Seen by the Brook. 
The third is Merry Gathering of Country Folk. The fourth is Thunder, Storm. And the fifth is Shepherd's Song, Cheerful and Thankful Feelings After the Storm. Obviously, titles like these directly influence how we listen to the music and what we imagine the music means to us. Importantly, however, Beethoven said that this symphony was more an expression of feeling rather than painting. That is to say, we shouldn't try to find too many direct or specific depictions of things in the music. We shouldn't need to say, oh, there's a horse, and that must be an oak tree or something, and so on. Rather, the symphony is more an expression of feelings inspired by the countryside. That being said, there are moments which unmistakably represent actual things. Take this moment where he actually labels the wind parts nightingale, quail, and cuckoo. Or this part from the movement Thunder Storm. I think that, again, by writing that it's more an expression of feeling than painting, Beethoven is influencing his audience to listen in a certain way, as expressive music first and foremost, over and above evoking specific countryside imagery. And indeed, Bernstein, in his Harvard lectures, suggests that if we try to erase anything we know about the countryside imagery in this symphony, we are still left with a wonderful masterpiece of symphonic form. The imagery that comes with it is an added bonus. So before we get into the music, I wanted to mention a fantastic music app that I've been using recently. It's called Encoda. That's N-K-O-D-A. It's an app which gives you immediate access to a huge bank of sheet music. I mean, literally tens of thousands of titles from massive publishers like Boozy and Hawks, Baron Writer, Novello, Chester, and many others. One of my favorite things about it is you can get immediate access to not only older works such as Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, where you can also get a piano version of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony and all the orchestral parts as well as the full score, but you can also get immediate access to some of the newest works in classical music. I don't know anything else that gives you access to such a rich and diverse library of sheet music right on your iPad, tablet, or computer. It's a subscription app, and they are offering free trials, so you should definitely check that out. You can find it at www.encoda.com. That's N-K-O-D-A dot com. You could even use it right now to find a score of Beethoven Sixth, so you can follow along with this podcast. So let's look at the music. The first movement starts like this. No, wait, that's the wrong symphony. The first movement, titled Awakening of Happy Feelings Upon Arrival at the Countryside, starts like this. Utter calm. Shortly afterwards, we get this. Ten bars of repeating exactly the same material. The only thing that is varied is the dynamic, gradually crescendoing to the halfway point and then diminuendoing to the end. And this is a tool that Beethoven uses throughout the symphony. Instead of the massive harmonic and melodic development, tension and climax that you get in the fifth symphony, you get this calm, soothing, sometimes undulating repetitiousness. We're away from all the bustle. We're in the countryside now. And as I say, the tool he uses for variety is the musical dynamics, moving gradually between loud and soft and loud again, like the opening and closing of a flower. So, the first movement is in sonata form, which is the most common musical form of that time. If you want to learn more about sonata form, you can on my YouTube channel, Inside the Score. The first subject is this, which we've already heard. And the second subject, in the dominant, is this material.
And the exposition ends with a coda very much grounded in C major. There's none of this crazy, dramatic surprises that we're used to in Beethoven's music. The key word here is simplicity. And notice again the repetitiousness. The development starts with this idea. Again, it grows through 12 bars of repetition. But this time it blossoms into a new key, moving from B flat major to D major, which is quite a shift by classical standards. And then it remains squarely in D major for 28 bars straight, with no conflict. You'd think all this repetition would lead to a very boring piece, but actually it's not boring. Something about that journey from B flat major to D major, and then about how it continues to grow to a dynamic climax, creates a perfectly satisfying musical experience without the need for intense harmonic or melodic development. Listen to the organic, satisfying growth of this passage. It's so satisfying, in fact, that Beethoven does it a second time, this time 12 bars of G major, followed by 28 bars of E major. So now he's shifting down a third instead of up, which has a different harmonic effect. What's really cool is how he gets back to the recapitulation. If you've watched my video on sonata form, you'll know that I say one of the main moments for musical awesomeness in sonata form is the transition from the development back into the recapitulation. It's a moment when composers can create absolutely maximum tension, craft these huge dominant pedals building massively on the dominant before a peak climax to enter back into the tonic for the recapitulation. Take the corresponding moment in Beethoven's fifth. But how does he do it in his sixth? Well, like this. The retransition is absolved of all tension. In fact, he doesn't even prepare it with a dominant chord. In almost all other sonata form examples, this moment should be marked with a significant 5-1 dominant tonic cadence. But here, it's 4-1. No more tension, only a serene transition back to our home key and home material. And the recapitulation goes along as you'd expect it to, with subtle differences. Like, for example, these 10 bars. When we'd heard them in the exposition, they grew louder to the halfway point and then quieter again. This time, it's the other way round. It grows quieter first and then louder. Beethoven is playing with dynamic variation instead of harmonic and melodic variation. He's toying with different parameters of musical composition. Finally, we reach a coda. Which reaches a peak. And then fades away. Before ending with a clear cadence, firm, but calm. How different was this experience from the first movement of Beethoven's Fifth? I know I keep bringing this up, but when we consider both were premiered at the same concert, the contrast seems particularly significant. Whatever he was doing in his Fifth Symphony, he ain't doing that here. But it is, in a very different way, a masterful composition. Movement two is titled Seen by the Brook. It starts with this lilting rhythmic motion, which some think sounds like the flowing of a brook.
And again, it's total serenity, calm, peaceful bliss. The movement could be read as a sonata form, but really, when listening, we can hear how Beethoven introduces a few simple ideas in the first minutes of the piece, and then simply plays with them, varies them, and explores them over the rest of the movement. It's really quite easy to follow. The first section uses this motif, and this closing idea, And then we meet this idea. As well as this one, which always gets stuck in my head. Then there's this little transition. Before we go back to our main first subject theme. And then we hear more of the music we've heard, with new variants and developments and new keys. It's not so hard to follow, and it's really worth listening to. It's a blissfully calm 12 minutes of music. Again, free of the Germanic tension we normally associate with Beethoven. And then famously, right at the end, the brook stops flowing, and we hear these three birds, which Beethoven marks nightingale, quail, and cuckoo. before finally he ends with a wistful coda. The third movement is titled Merry Gathering of the Country Folk. It's a kind of symphonic scherzo in a scherzo trio scherzo form, though he brings the trio back twice, so it's kind of an ABABA version of a scherzo. Here is the pleasant main idea. Though Beethoven can't quite hold back, and it takes off a bit. The music still has a rustic feel to it. Then there's this second theme. And then we finally move into this particularly rustic trio section, which feels like it could be some kind of country dance. Notice the constant emphasis on the downbeat of each bar. Then we get the full scherzo again, then the full trio again, as written. Then, for the last time, the scherzo music comes back, but this time it's curtailed. Then suddenly, a faster presto section. And at the coda, it transitions right into the storm. Movement four, thunder, storm. And listen to how that scherzo music transforms into a different kind of music, as if the merry country folk are now scuttling and worried, trying to find shelter from the incoming storm. And then it arrives. Unmistakably thunder and some thunderclaps.
This movement really does stand out as a high point of tension and drama in an otherwise calm symphony. The others have been so cheerful. This movement is actually relatively short. It's just a passing storm, thank goodness. And we can hear as it fades away. And then we hear the rumbles of thunder as the clouds have moved on to another village. And as the storm passes, we hear this music in the winds. Kind of the same as the brook music from Movement 2. And this seamlessly transitions into Movement 5, Shepherd's Song. Happy and grateful feelings after the storm. Here is their horn call. and the first theme perhaps expressing gratitude, a smile after the storm. And this builds up to a fuller statement. You can really sense the joy of the countryside. There's this idea in the winds. Which unfolds. Then there's some development of the main theme in the lower strings. And then we return to a variation on the main theme. First violins playing this flowing figure, while the second violins subtly hide the main theme in their pizzicato plucking. Then it all begins to build up and up in excitement to a high point of joy. And from there, it continues with variations on the ideas Beethoven has introduced, right up to one of these great high points. Then it winds down for a quiet, almost prayerful coda, as if wishing farewell to the countryside as you prepare to return to the city. It's just a fantastic and very evocative piece of music. So beautiful, often serene, and it shows a different side to Beethoven, that he's not all fire and storminess, and his evocation of the countryside really does feel timeless and still resonant today. So, for recordings, if you want a filmed performance, I love the Beethoven cycle conducted by Daniel Barenboim and the East West Divan Orchestra from the 2012 BBC Proms. You can find them on YouTube or you can buy them on DVD. I just think he's had a lifetime with Beethoven and he brings some incredible things out of the music. The orchestra is fantastic too. It's a very large orchestra performance, uh, a tradition inherited from Herbert von Karajan and Furtwängler before him. But I love that, to be honest. If you want a recorded performance on CD, you could try the Berlin Philharmonic conducted by Claudio Abado in 2000. 
Or if you want to hear an incredible storm, try Herbert von Karajan's recording with the Berlin Philharmonic in the 1970s. I think it's 1977 or 1976. Finally, if you want a period orchestra recording, that is, a recording which plays on instruments Beethoven would have used and which follows 19th century performance practices, you could try Roger Norrington conducting the London Classical Players. I actually love period instrument recordings. It's a totally different sound, and it brings such a different sense of life and vibrancy to the music than we're used to with modern orchestras, which sound so massive and almost filmic. The thing about period instruments is sometimes you can hear why Beethoven made certain decisions. You can hear, oh, that's how it would have sounded in his time. And now I get it, that's a totally different sound. So anyway, Thank you for listening. If you want to help support this channel or buy me a coffee to say thank you, you can visit my Patreon page. It's patreon.com forward slash inside the score. Thanks again to Shannon for the suggestion for this podcast. I do monthly suggestion boxes on Patreon. I wish I could cover every single suggestion I get, but I really value your ideas. So do come and visit my Patreon and maybe I'll cover your idea next. We also have occasional question and answer sessions where I try to answer all of your questions in video format. So do have a visit. Again, thank you for watching and see you soon.